Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking with Paul Bloom, who is a professor of psychology at University of Toronto, emeritus at Yale University. Paul is also one of North America's best-known public intellectuals on children, the psychology of children, empathy, human emotions, various features of cognition. He has numerous excellent books. I've enjoyed all of them. The most recent is called Psych, the Story of the Human Mind. But again, you can read all of them. He has a new Substack, which is excellent, Small Potatoes. He is a bit still on Twitter and is more generally a force of nature. Paul, welcome. <laughs> Tyler, it's very nice to talk to you. I have just some very general questions about psychologists, and I'd like to hear your take on it. And they run along the lines of like, how much do you people understand anyway? So your partner, I believe, is a psychologist. You're a psychologist. If you're sitting in a restaurant and you're listening to a couple talk at the other table, do you two feel you understand them better than like two smart non-psychologists? No, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. We have no special ability to manipulate people, to understand people. You could say that that reflects a weakness of the field, and maybe it does, but I don't think psychologists are any savvier about human nature in that sort of day-to-day, -day, on the spot way than anybody else. So you don't think, say, that you're better parents on average? No, I don't. I think we tend, we tend to be good parents because the sort of person who becomes a psychologist is probably more sensitive to other people's feelings, well-educated, you know, and tend to be affluent enough to provide kids with with good stuff. But no, not, not any more so than an anthropologist or a biochemist. But say I took two economists and I flew them to a poor nation that they didn't really know anything about. And I asked them to make some guesses about what might be wrong with the economy. Uh, they would do better than equivalently smart people who are not economists. L like what's the feature of psychological research that stops it from translating into higher understanding? Like, how do you model what you all produce? I think we understand certain subdomains. So um, I think I have a better understanding of memory and the fallibility of memory than a lot of people. I think I have more of a grasp of mental, mental disorders. I know maybe a bit more about child development in the sense of what ages things will come about. I know I, I can make, say, I think, some reasonably intelligent, maybe surprising things about social movements and how people behave in groups. So it's not like we don't know anything about the world. It's just it doesn't translate for for whatever reason into day-to-day -day contact. Talking with you now, I'm no better at figuring out what you want from this conversation than anyone else would be. But let's say we took a batch of you and trained you for two years to do that translation. The people who are the most insightful, who let's say they're not psychologists, but they're astute observers of human nature, and they train you all for two years, like, would you then be better? than others? Are you trainable? Maybe. It's, it's a good question. Are people trainable? So, you know, Phil Tetlock talks about super forecasters and talks about how do you get people who could better predict the future. And you could imagine tr either training people, either by sort of weeding them out in some sort of program where you try to find the most naturally gifted and understanding people, or training them in certain techniques, which probably are, are available, that would make them better at understanding other people. It just brings us quite a distance from psychology as is normally studied. I commonly hear the view that psychologists have more neuroses than non-psychologists. Is that actually true? Is there data behind it? Or is that just a poke people want to make? The joke we make in, in, within the department is that the clinical psychologists are all a bit crazy. The ones who study memory and development and, and neurotransmitters are kind of normal. Um, I don't think it's true. As it, I, th I think it is mostly a joke. It could be true in some degree in clinical psychology where people might go into the field in order to address issues and problems that they have. I mean, it, 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 it's hard to distinguish some issues of cause and effect here. So I have some friends who, I know a lot of people who are really into mindfulness meditation, and some of the people who are most into it are people who are actually the most troubled. But maybe, it's, maybe they'd be much more troubled if they weren't into mindfulness meditation. Now, on infants and children, there's a question my daughter, who's a big fan of yours, wanted me to ask you, and that's, quote, what is the most misunderstood thing about children? that most parents could practically use to improve their relationships with kids, unquote. Oh, that's nice. Um, 
probably the most misunderstood thing, period, is that they're blank slates. A lot of people walk around thinking that babies know nothing. Um, and that's not true. There, there's a tremendous body of evidence now showing a quite sophisticated understanding of the physical and social world is there from the get-go. And it's some research I've been involved in, but researchers like Elizabeth Spelke and Rene Bayarchon have really charted the baby's mind and found some extraordinary things. Now, that's, that's a way to sort of enjoy your baby, watching those, those, those things uh, develop. From a useful standpoint, it might be useful to know that some of the negative aspects of, of humans are present early on. And so you may not, you, you shouldn't be too surprised when your child um, it, it has an us them psychology. It's very quick to see, to, to split the world into the people that they care about and, and, and the rest of people. And you should take that in stride. It's not because you taught them anything bad. Um, I think certain sex differences are largely hardwired. And so parents shouldn't blame themselves if they find their, their, their son is walking around pretending to fire guns at people and, and their daughter's doing more maternal play. Um, so I think some, knowing some of the fact that some of this is, is innate, that does not mean it can't be changed, but some of this is innate, is actually pretty useful for a parent. Let's say two people are having an argument and one is being a jerk and the other is not being a jerk. At what age are young children old enough to figure out who's being the jerk? <laughs> Does um, a two-year-old know? A three-year-old? Well, if, if you take the notion of jerk uh, broadly enough, uh, the nine-month-old knows. So you, you, you show in, in some experiments that, that that I've been involved in at Yale, you show babies uh, little one-act plays where you have this little thing trying to get up a hill, and one character helps it up the hill, and the other one shoves it down. And later on, when exposed to these two characters to help or to hinder, babies prefer uh, the helper. So under that very broad notion of, of a jerk, you get it pretty early on. I think in other ways, I think that that's actually a very emerging ability, the ability to tell, tell the good from the bad. And what's your theory of how they tell the difference? Well, the origin of this, I think, is natural selection. I think some part of our moral capacity is, is hardwired. And then the question is, um, what do they view as sort of the cues to goodness and badness? And I think it tends to be physical acts like, like helping um, or hindering. Like you, they recognize that, that creatures have goals and some facilitate the goals, some want the goals. It could be something as hitting or caressing. There's some work that says that babies, maybe not surprisingly, prefer hitters, sorry, prefer caressers to hitters. What else might they be aware of that we don't necessarily know about? You might know about it, but I don't. Well, who's, there's some, who's a jerk? Who's not a jerk? What else? Well, there's some lovely work by Katie Kinsler on how children break the world up into us versus them. And you might think that they do it like adults do on the basis of race, which is very, very common and, and in some way. And sooner or later, they do that. But early on, they take language very seriously. So children at a very young age prefer to affiliate with, an, as an American child, prefers to affiliate with an English speaker than a French speaker, also prefers to affiliate, to give toys with, to play with, somebody who speaks English without an accent than somebody who speaks English with a faint accent. So the importance of language as a sort of marker of group affiliation shows up very early. At what age do you think children can, quote unquote, really believe in God? Hmm. Um, with a student, Coney Banerjee, we wrote an article a while ago called, Would Tarzan Believe in God? Will somebody who, without a cultural support, come to believe in God? And we came to the conclusion that he'd end up being polytheistic, that he'd see gods everywhere. He'd see, uh, he'd see them in, as triggered by nature and everything. Um, I think children early on believe in invisible agents causing things. They had that sort of bias. Whether it would rise, when it rises to the level where you could coherently say, oh, that kid believes in God, I think that probably is a bit later. I think you need some sort of cultural support to make it into a god, as opposed to just some sort of strange stuff is happening that you can't explain. But say if you were to give it a number, how many years old? Four. And do you think that's the same age at which a kid can really believe in Santa Claus, or there's a difference? <laughs> is God I, a tougher climb, or is it the you same? Know, you know, there, there's fundamentalist parents who don't want their kids to believe in Santa Claus. And the logic is, once they hear that Santa Claus isn't real, they'll jettison God as well. Um, I think in some ways Santa Claus is, is uh, an easier climb because he's just, you know, 
a, a, a big guy who looks like, who, you know, a big beard and who, who climbs down chimneys and gives gifts. It's, it's kind of a small step from, uh, from a sort of very capable and kind person to Santa Claus. Well, God, in the sense that we're talking about it, is, you know, invisible and omniscient and, and, and all good. So I think God's a much bigger climb. So I'll say Santa Claus at two or three. Okay. And you may see Santa Claus in a department store, right? That's going to make exactly. it really... You, you, know, you don't sit on God's lap, but, but Santa, you do. Now, if you think Tarzan is going to start off polytheistic, why is it in the world we see so much monotheism? So there's a billion Muslims, uh, yeah. over a billion Christians. Now, maybe they're not all very strictly monotheistic, but still, monotheism is, has been the trend for a long time. It has been. And it has been. Why that? Why, why something that runs counter to instinct that would be dominating? So it, one idea, and this, this is Robert Wright's claim, but I think other people have argued this, that we start off poly, that polytheism is sort of the default. Societies start off polytheistic. Even in the Hebrew Bible, it might begin rather polytheistic. When, when God talks about not worshiping other gods uh, instead of him, he's literally talking about other gods. And, but you're right, monotheism has won. And then, so there has to be some sort of design features that that allow it to win, even though it may not be our natural default. Um, so one argument, I, I, the answer is I don't know, but one argument that I that that I have heard is that these singular big gods actually serve moral purposes. They they hold communities together. If you believe in a single omniscient God that looks at you and looks at me. It could govern our behavior in certain ways, coordinate it, cause us to be nicer when we're not being observed and so on. And so the claim is that societies that have that have an advantage over societies that have a hundred mischievous little gods running around. So that's enforced through some kind of group selection mechanism? That would, cultural group selection would be the idea, yeah. In general, how bullish are you on the notion of group selection as a mechanism? Very critical of it as an evolutionary mechanism. I've I've been convinced that that it it almost certainly it could happen in principle, but I've been convinced the sort of Dawkins viewed it that it doesn't happen in practice. But um it seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to talk in terms of cultures, to say that some cultures do better than others. Those cultures thrive. And now we're not talking about genes, we're talking about communities of people. At what age do infants on net actually start enjoying life? That on the benthamite <laughs> calculus, they're a plus rather than a minus. That's such. I I I tried to. I I I did a Twitter poll asking people: um, Are babies overall happy or sad based on your experience? And it it came out and the happy sort of one. It probably depends on the baby. Um, it but averaging, depends, right? Uh, average they, a, average a hundred babies. In our society, I think I think the life of a baby is actually of a young baby is probably pretty uh, difficult. Your, your needs are not immediately satisfied. You have a lot of needs. You're in a lot of pain all the time. You have gas pain. You're hungry. You have to, um, you, you, you're struggling. You're afraid. Um, I would think that roughly around the age of two, you get much more autonomy and then, then life starts looking up and then it just gets better and better. I would think at one and a half on that they're happy based on my limited data sample. Do you think it, do you think it corresponds to the, to the burgeoning of language? No, I just think it, in wealthy countries, uh, they're fed enough, and they they just smile more. It seems to me, they take pleasure in more things. So, like seeing a dog on TV or something, yeah. or seeing a car go by, they seem to enjoy in a way where I, I at least don't witness them enjoying that at seven months. Yeah, that that makes sense. There's a sense in which wealthy countries might be at a disadvantage, where in a lot of wealthy countries, babies sleep apart from their parents. You know, there's a separate room with a crib. You cry it out and so on. And, you know, I'm I'm not judging. I did that with, with one of my kids a long time ago. But it's very hard on the kid. And in less wealthy countries, the kid co-sleeps and sleeps in the same room. And I think that's better off for the kid. Rough on the parents, but better for the kid. Now, as you've noted in your research, young children sometimes, maybe often, will think that the lives of 10 dogs are worth more than the life of a single human. Hmm. Are they wrong? E yes. Why? I, well, I'm not... <laughs> and what's the right someone, number? Like yeah, the right number, dogs? This, this, is, this is a challenge because I, if I say I'm, I'm wrong, you could just keep that, that no one human is worth more. You could keep upping the, the number of dogs. Um, the, the idea... So 
your your view aligns with that of uh, Maddie Wilkes, who is uh, my my collaborator and ex postdoc who ran this research, and she's very much of a of a utilitarian and an animal rights person, and so she thinks kids are superior. She finds in this work you're talking about, kids are less speciesist than than adults. They even will favor ten pigs over one human, and adults in our sample never do that. And gradually, these, this speciesism comes in until you get to a person like me who thinks, oh, my God, a person's so much more valuable. Um, and Maddie would say what happens is this, this irrational prejudice creeps in that I have and maybe you don't have. I don't know. I'm, I'm a troubled utilitarian where for the most part I am. I just would find it very difficult to trade any number of dogs for a human life. What, what about you? If you, if you would make the trade off, what, what, how many dogs? I don't think we can make utility comparisons across species. I think we can make limited claims about potential gains from trade with humans and dogs a lot, humans and pigs quite a bit less, but still somewhat. And that ultimately maybe we can apply some semi-Christian like idea of mercy to how we should treat animals and that we only have partial comparisons. That would be my answer. We have to make some, I mean, maybe we can't, but in some way we have to, when we think about animal experimentation or, sure. or of course, using animal food, we have to, if somebody said, you know, there's research we're going to do, which will save a child's life, but it will, will, will involve killing a, a million dogs. I think people might balk at it, but if it was killing two dogs, people wouldn't. But I also can't, can't fix a number. There's that other question you've asked in your work. How much would you have to be paid to strangle a cat? <laughs> it's, not, it's not my question, but yes. But you can take that money and save human lives. I think Oxfam has claimed it's a few thousand dollars well spent, could save a human life. Whatever the sum is, it's not ginormous, right? So how much would you have to be paid to strangle a cat? Um, one reason why I've liked that question is people want a lot of money. And in fact, this is an experiment done by, by Thorndike, the great behaviorist over a hundred years ago. And he asked that question. He also asked people, how much would I have to pay you to, for you to take a pair of pliers and pull out one of your, your front tooth? And people want more money to strangle a cat than to have this painful, agonizing, disfiguring thing, which I think says something nice about people. But then the fact is that it's not so nice about people from sort of a strict utilitarian calculus. You should actually ask to be paid some amount of money for which you can then save many, many lives or, for that matter, save many, many cats. Um, and our morality doesn't work that way. We have, we have a sort of visceral response to certain behavior that doesn't translate to a sort of cold-blooded assessment of pain and pleasure. And do you feel you should try to train yourself out of being unwilling to strangle the cat? Or you're going to double down on how you are? I double down on a few things. So my utilitarian friends tells me, tell me that my, my affection and, and the, the resources I put into my, my children are irrational, that I should not be favoring them over strangers, certainly not to the extent I do. And I hold back on that. I, 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 if, if, you get, if you offered me a pill that would get rid of my favoring my children, I would not take it. For animals and treatment of animals and cat strangling, I think we should try to talk ourselves out of this. I think we should, in some way, try to make reason to make the world a better place, even if it involves strangling some cats. I have some questions about intelligence for you. Uh, if we think of large language models, should we let them feel disgust in order so that they avoid left-wing bias? <laughs> That's a... So... Why would, is the idea, why would disgust make them avoid left-wing bias? Maybe we're not sure it would, but there are various claims in the literature that for people on the right, disgust is a more fundamental emotion, and that a greater capacity to feel disgust encourages people in some ways to be more socially conservative. Uh, debatable, but I don't think it's a yeah. crazy view. So if you build LLMs and you give them, say, a lot of empathy and not much or any disgust, you're going to get left-leaning LLMs, which you might say, well, that was my goal, but obviously not everyone will accept that conclusion either. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want woke LLMs. I wouldn't want, I, I think there's a lot in sort You've of- You've got them, extreme, of course. I've, I've got them. I, could, I, think, I think Gemini is the one if I wanted to go, the, the woke LLM of choice. Um, because I think, I think you know, the, the doctrine called, called wokeness uh, leads to a lot of moral problems and makes the world worse in certain ways. But I wouldn't mind left-wing LLMs 
LLMs. And in fact, I'm not a fan of disgust. I mean, the, 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 you're right that disgust is often associated with the right, with right wing, but in the very worst uh, instantiation of it. So disgust is what drives hatred towards gay people. It involves a, a, a hatred of interracial marriage, uh, the exclusion of immigrants, the exclusion of other races. So if there's one emotion I would take away from people, it would be disgust, at least disgust in sort of the moral realm. They could keep their disgust towards rotten food and that sort of thing. Um, and so I wouldn't, that's the one thing I wouldn't put into LLMs. I'd rather put, I don't know, anger, pity, gratitude. Disgust is the one thing I'd keep away. So you wouldn't just cut back on it at the margin. You would just take disgust out of people if you could? I'm an, I'm 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 conscious enough about the limits of of our knowledge, which is that I would be very trepidatious before removing an emotion from people because you you don't know what the the consequences would be, but yeah, yeah, I think I think on the, I, I think I every every it's hard to think, and maybe you could think of an example where disgust has made the world better. Well, disgust combined with other views might make people more cautious. So if yes. you take Canada, well, I've been very positive on Canada's pro-migration policies. There needs to be some limit, right? And maybe it's some form of disgust mixed in with other views that will enforce that limit. So, so your view is, and I think, and I, I've, I've written on empathy, and I've heard a sort of similar argument for this, which is you could have a, de a, a decision which you ground, and you may be thinking about immigration, on a sort of rational cost-benefit analysis. But you might say, look, for people to, to act towards this decision, your average person won't do it my way. They would need some emotion. So maybe they need disgust or empathy to take them there. And so you might want to argue that without, would the argument go that without disgust, Canadians wouldn't be motivated to do a policy that on balance would be better for them? Possibly. And I just think back and I figure, well, disgust must have been socially functional at some stage of development, not perfectly functional, but it had some benefits. And you might have a very detailed argument for why all those earlier benefits have vanished. But I think I would be skeptical. And I'm surprised you think that, say, your views toward migration are not equally emotional as, say, the social conservatives. Yours might be correct. But do you think yours are that much less emotional and more rational? I think on a whole, some views are more rational than, than others. So, um, I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask. Everybody's going to tell you their views are grounded in a sort of rational equation. They thought them out and everything like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic enough to John Haidt's line that often we delude ourselves and, and we're driven by, by these emotions. But I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't say that the person who says, Black people and white people shouldn't marry because it grosses me out is should be thought of on the same level as somebody who says, eh, you know, what harm does it do? I think the what harm does it do person is 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 better is is being a better person. Your view that there's too much empathy. You wrote a book called Against Empathy. What emotion in you does that come from? <laughs> For me, it comes um, from frustration with other people. So I hold that same view, but I feel it's rooted in my emotions as much as my reason. And I then rationalize it with my reason. I see ex post, my emotions are actually somewhat correct, but it stems from my frustration with others. Maybe for me, shame and guilt. I think I've made a lot of mistakes and moral mistakes in my life by being too too caught up in empathy. And so my argument against empathy is is limited. It, it, it argues that empathy is a poor moral guide. It leads it leads to bad to bad decisions. And to some, if I have to ground in my own emotions, it might be regret regret over my own bad decisions. I think I suffer from an abundance of empathy. I think at the margin, I've moved against empathy more. Being a podcast host, that I'll ask a question. Wait, wait, wait. Why, why, why being a podcast host? Well, I'll ask a question, and a lot of guests think it's high status simply to signal empathy rather than giving a substantive answer. And the signaling empathy answers I find quite uninteresting. And I think a lot of my listeners do too. Yet people will just keep on doing this. And I get frustrated. And then I think, well, Tyler, you should turn a bit more against empathy for this reason. And I think that's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. And I, 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 I feel your frustration. What do you think we learn about language from large language models being so good? You know, the success of large language models is the biggest surprise in my intellectual life. 
And we learn that a lot of what we used to believe may be false. And what I used to believe may be false. So I used to really accept to a large degree the Chomskyan argument that language, the structures of language are too complex and not manifest in input so that you need to have innate machinery to learn them. You need to have a language module or language instinct. And it's impossible to learn them simply by observing statistics in the environment. If it's true that, and I, I think it is true, the LLMs learn language through statistical analysis, this shows the Chomskyan view is wrong. This shows that at least in theory, it's possible to learn language just by observing a billion tokens of language. Doesn't mean that that's how children do it. It's possible, and I think, I, I do believe that kids have some sort of innate apparatus that helps them do it. But it's no longer a sort of logical truth. It's something which you have to do in empirical research. If, if you gave an LLM, and I know people are doing this very research, gave an LLM the same speech that a, a, your average developing child gets, will it learn to talk? Now, the day we're taping this, coincidentally, it's the same day that GBT 4.0 came out, which probably you haven't played around with yet. It's only been out for about an hour. Uh, I, I was with it before taping. It seems to me amazing. But how, how good are LLMs as therapists? Um, there's been experiments which have pitted them against people in short-term interactions. Like you, you express, you talk about your troubles and then you get a person like me to give a response. Then you get, um, GPT-4 to respond. And over and over and over again, people rate the, the, the AI response as more empathic, more understanding. Now, I think that this is impressive. I think what we have yet to see is whether they could have a long sustained conversation, holding in memory over multiple sessions. You know, part of me being a good therapist and actually just being a good friend is I remember what you're worried about. I could go back to it. I could talk about it and so on. Uh, and I don't think they're at that stage yet. I don't see any reason why they can't get there. You know, there's a version of GPT-4 which does have memory. It's only been, I think, for about a week and I haven't tested it yet. I don't know how good the memory is. Some people prefer to turn the memory off, actually. Uh, but it's very much on the verge of being here. But say two, three years from now, what percentage of therapy done do you think will be done with humans rather than LLMs? Because the LLM is free and you can yeah. stay at home. Well, you can with the therapist with Zoom, but the LLM is super easy. If you include by therapy um, somebody just regularly talking to her LLM about their problems and getting some advice and everything, I think that human interaction within not too many years will be the minority of interactions. I think people people will be very drawn to AI therapists. Um, it, it, there's some evidence that we have a prejudice against AIs. So you give the same sort of, fit, there was a, a paper recently that gave the same sort of response, the exact same response to two groups of people, told one of them it's a person, the other one it's an AI. The people told it was an AI said, oh, that wasn't very empathic. That wasn't very understanding. But my feeling is this prejudice will fade over time and that it's mostly people more our age than people who are, you know, 18 or 20. The people who are, the people who are best at working with LLMs, what kind of psychological intelligence do you think they have? Who's going to be good at that? I think you need a certain flexibility, um, a certain degree of patience, and you need to develop a theory of mind with LLMs that is different from the theory of mind you need uh, for people. So I, I was recently asked, asked Claude, who I, I Claude, Claude, anyway, I, I use it, I use it a lot. And I asked it, I said, there's a phenomenon in children I found, is the same phenomena show up in adults? I was, and, I said, I was, and, I, and I plainly framed the question that I wanted to answer to be yes. And I said, yes, there is. It is, here are three papers that show it, you know, decisively. None of the papers were real. It hallucinated it because it's what I wanted. And then I went back and I said, look, I'll lose my job if you give me papers that are, that are false, that are made up. You've got to be accurate. I'm in big trouble. Then it did much better. So you've got to game them to some extent in, in a very different way than you game a person. And that capacity is something which I think is essential for dealing with them, at least for the current models. Here's a simple question. What's the best test of whether someone or something has a theory of mind? Um, I think conversation. 
I think a sustained conversation. So, you know, the, there are technical tests like the false belief task or reading the mind and the eyes task, but those are easily gamed. Those, those are, I, LLMs will succeed on them because they've seen, you know, thousands and thousands of instances on them. I think in conversation, if a lack of theory of mind quickly reveals itself. And um, so success at solving a sort of Turing test is success at theory of mind. Well, but Claude 3 can converse very well, uh, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't have a theory of mind, or do you think it does? Well, it, it, I'm using theory of mind, a word like theory of mind, meaning the, the manifestation as if it did. Does it really think that other people have minds? Does it have a model of people's psychology? When it says, I understand exactly what you're feeling, does it sort of call back its own experiences? I doubt it. So maybe in some way you're, you're asking an even easier question, which is what will show that it has consciousness? But you could have consciousness and not a theory of mind, right? Yes. But you were saying, I think that to have theory of mind involves something you might call consciousness. But what's the extra thing above having consciousness that indicates a person has a theory of mind? So we reject the false belief test. That makes sense yep. to me. What is it then? What's the test? I think what you'd have to do, and you could do this on the fly, you could work it out, would be develop a... a well, okay, here's a good test. Um, read, it, read it half of a good novel and then ask... What's going on here? What's going to happen next? Show it half of a, of, a, of a TV episode. And when we do these things, our theory of mind is just fully operational. We, we say that detective is, 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 is going to get his, his revenge because he will not take that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, and she's going to leave him the first moment she has a chance. Da, 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 da. And I think that shows theory of mind at work. And if you do it in that way, you can't cheat. If it's a novel, novel or, or, or novel episode, then, then it would have to do it on the fly. I'm afraid I'm going to fail that test. I always think up strange imaginary endings that are improbable, and occasionally they come to pass. <laughs> and I think my endings are often much better than what they end up putting on the screen. My dad is great. When we watched TV together as a kid, he would, and of course the TV was very different and much more predictable, but a character would be about to say something, and then he would say it. He would, like, he would say it simultaneously with the character. My wife does this too, ask. yeah. She's great yeah. at this. Yeah. Do monkeys have cognitive dissonance? Well, I've done some research suggesting that they might of a sort. And uh, the cognitive dissonance, the, the, the sort of cognitive dissonance we were interested in is that when we choose something, that makes you say out of a choice of two things, that makes you like it more and makes you like the things that you didn't choose less. And um, in some work with uh, Lori Santos, who had a thriving monkey lab, we found that capuchins did the same thing. We also found three-year-olds did the same thing. Endowment effects, right? I think there's also evidence for, that's a separate thing, but I think there's some evidence that monkeys also show endowment effects. Are we sure that's dissonance? The endowment effects, I'm less sure that it's dissonance. It might, it might, there, there's alternative explanations. The, the favoring that which you chose is kind of a textbook example of dissonance. That's dissonance, if, every, if, if anything is. But what if you want to carry a story with you of what it meant to you, and your act of choosing helped create and define the story, and you value things through this narrative function, and you actually ought to be that way? Is that so improbable? No, no. Um, I guess the, the experiments that, that test it aren't open to that kind of interpretation. It can often be like, you know, we give you two M&Ms and you just choose one at random. And then later when you rank the, the taste of the M&Ms, you'd say, oh, the one I, I picked is tastier than the one I didn't pick. Well, if we simply handed it to you, you wouldn't get that effect. So there's not much of a narrative to that. But I agree that when you get it more complicated in life, it could serve all sorts of other functions. How much does formal education boost IQ? The data are a little bit. Each, each year you're in school, your IQ goes a little bit up. And, and the skeptics will say, I think Brian Kaplan says, you, know, you get better at taking tests. Um, you get better at, at, at sort of a scholastic way of thinking. I do think, though, that education, period, does play a role in making you smarter. It, gets you, it gives you practice in dealing with abstractions, with hypotheticals, the sort of things that we often view as markers of intelligence. 
Do people overestimate or underestimate your intelligence? You. My own? Yeah. You <laughs> must know. Um, it seems like either way, it's a humiliating answer. But, um, but I, would, I would imagine, I, particularly when I was at, at Yale, I think they overestimate it. People sometimes like ask me questions about domains which I have no knowledge about, and they, they take me seriously about that. Isn't that an overestimation? What about you? Oh, they way overestimate my intelligence, but th they underestimate how much I know. It's interesting. I know a lot, and they mistake that for innate intelligence is what happens in my case. So you know even more than you seem to know, which is it, quite a lot. In my opinion. So I'm being like both modest and not modest. I noticed, With each yeah. part of the answer. Uh, but I think I take good care to try to apply what I know, and people mistake that for, again, high IQ. It's not entirely clear that isn't high IQ. That IQ might be largely built on a scaffolding of a lot of knowledge. Partly, yeah. But it's something else as well. Like there's some kind of G yes. where I think I'm actually yes. much weaker. Maybe uh, maybe there's a trade-off, which is the more knowledge you have, the, you, the less G you need to get to the same point where somebody with less knowledge would need a lot of G to get to that point. And why do you think it's worked out the way it has that people overestimate your intelligence? Because you were at Yale? Yeah, prestige bias. I'm a university professor. I'm at Yale. Maybe, maybe I benefit from other forms of privilege being, you know, an older white man. But I don't know. Just, uh, but I, I show all the markers of a smart guy. Do you think when you interact with other people that you're too much impressed by their intelligence or not enough? Because a lot of smart people overvalue smarts and others. And why not just drive that out of your calculus? Is it so hard? No, I, I, I read your talent book and it was actually very, very useful to me because I, it, it taught me other ways, other things to look for. When it comes to choosing graduate students, for instance, I tend to rank intelligence very highly. And, and, you know, a good conversation with someone who's quicker than me and smart on their feet and everything. I value that very highly. It's only recently I started to try to also value things like, you know, productivity and work ethic and, 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 and other things and a certain degree of creativity. But, but, um, but I would just, I go too much for smarts. What do you think is psychologically the hardest trait for us to value properly? Disagreeableness or something else? Because after all, they might be disagreeing with you, right? Yeah. Disagreeableness, probably honesty. You know, um, one of the tropes on social media I, I, I hate the most is when somebody says, you know, well, here I am and now I'm a professor and people and, and I want to tell I want to say somebody uh, to somebody who was my my advisor many years ago said I'd never make it. Um, well, you're a jerk. And everybody laughs at the person who said they'd never make it. And to be honest with somebody and in that case, they were wrong. But but even if you're right, people hate you to be honest with somebody when they say to you, um, you know, what do you think of my book? Do you think I'm suited for this job? stuff like that can be doing them a huge service. Am I with the right person? Can be doing them a huge service and the reward you will get is hatred and resentment. So on your Substack, Small Potatoes, you wrote a post on doing academic interviews. The interviewers, at a general level, what's the bias they're most likely to have? Oh, all sorts of biases. And, and, and I'm almost leaning towards, you know, your, your book aside, jettisoning interviews sometimes, getting rid of them. But um, all sorts of biases. They're biased, by, they're biased by charm. They're biased by quickness. They're biased by uh, flattery. And in fact, my advice, part of my advice to put it somewhat cynically is for people on job interviews, know the person you're talking to, do their research, because it's kind of flattering. You know, somebody comes into my office and said, oh, my God, it's such an honor to meet you. I, I read Against Empathy and it changed my life. That's, that's not, I, I don't want it to sway me, but it's hard for it not to. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's our weakness. I've wondered quite often, why is flattery undersupplied in these contexts? Because by no means does everyone do it. It's not very costly. Uh, in, even if you're not fully believed, it can have a positive impact on the person. So why isn't the supply of flattery just way, way up there? It's Every such job cheap, interview. It's such a, a cheap thing, yeah. Yeah, it starts off with, oh, I, I read your article two years ago. It was wonderful. It changed how I think about tax incidents. But not every interview starts that way. Most do not. Why not? I tell the, I tell the story in, in, in my substack of 
very famous senior figure, comes to figure, I never met him before, comes to my office, and says, oh my God, it is such a delight to meet you, and talks all about my work extensively. And I fully knew, even my ego is not, so I fully knew he read up on me. And, but it still felt great. It still felt, I don't know. I, I feel maybe um, people are uncomfortable, flattering. Maybe there's an awkwardness when you're, when you're talking to somebody who is of a higher status than you and you want to draw from it. Maybe it feels inappropriate to flatter. Like, who am I to tell this person their work is great? I don't know. You, st you still think they ought to do it more, right? As do I. Do. I. Yeah, I do. I do. There should be, there's, there's a flattery shortage in the world. And, and, and it's going back to kind of a criticism abundance sometimes where I think people have a false theory of mind where they, they go to somebody and, and they say, you know, I read your stuff and I think it's really poorly thought out. Could be very helpful from a friend, not a good tactic when you're looking for a job. So how can we train people to be better flatterers? What do we need to do? Um, Maybe it's some degree of sort of theory of mind, which is you just ask people, to enjoy, how do you feel when somebody tells you how wonderful you are? And uh, I think that that, that will help them uh, do it. it. It doesn't seem like a very difficult thing to pick up. So I don't know. It's a mystery. So if we should train flattery, how do you think we should best tax empathy? In the broad sense of tax, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we should... I think we should tax empathy through social disapproval. And here's what I'm thinking. Um, a lot of American politicians say racist things and have racist policies, but almost always they cloak it. They dog whistle it. They cloak it. Maybe they aren't even aware of it themselves. Because if, if when somebody says something avowed, clearly racist, people boo them. People, be, they, 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 they suffer a huge social cost. I'd like to say the same, see the same thing with regard to overt displays of empathy. So I would like to see that, you know, when, when a politician comes up and says, I want to talk about the health care plan and says, I want to read you a letter I got from an eight-year-old who told me the story about her father. I want to audit the crowd to boo and, and to shout, don't treat us like children. I think empathy could easily be used as a tool for all sorts of things. And if we stop putting up with it, um, it would discourage it. Where is the empathy problem worse, Canada or the United States? I think everything is both worse and better in the United States. Um, there's I think, broader uh, variance? There's broader, there's broader variance. The politics is more intense, is a lot more interesting. Um, I think the degree of sort of empathic pandering, as well as the degree of everything else, is more accelerated in, in the States. I think part of Canadian politics with Parliament encourages more vibrant debate and discussion, often at a pretty high level that you don't see in, in the States. Do you think there are any humans who are what I would call truly egalitarian? So there's plenty of people who genuinely want to redistribute wealth, but typically I think they have other status markers. It could be intellect, it could be empathy, it could be a certain kind of left-wing politics. Are there people who are genuinely egalitarian across all dimensions? No. I think I think you you you'd cease to become a person. I mean, to become to become indifferent between the present and the future, indifferent between your child and a stranger, to be to to not care about somebody's looks or intelligence or or kindness would be. You could imagine an LLM program for that, but I think when we encountered the LLM, we'd find it repellent. And the the person would disgust us. Yes, and that's the case where disgust might be useful, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay. You have, you have come full circle on me. Yes. Um, yes. Why do so many people enjoy horror movies? For the most part, I do not. I'll interject, but clearly many do. Do you enjoy any, any movies that, that scare you that, uh, of, of a lighter sort, not, not gory, not chainsaw stuff, but lighter. That I enjoy. So Darth Vader comes on the screen. I wouldn't say I'm scared, but I feel the negative evil presence and I respond to that in an aesthetically positive way. Yeah, I think I, I I think that that's right. Where we take some sort of pleasure from negative emotions, but like sadness and fear and disgust and and even guilt, shame. But there's a lot of variation in which emotions people like. Some people like a good cry. Some people like to scream, and the intensity of it, 
where I do like scary movies, but for me, it's like the Babadook or something like, or, you know, it follows the, the gory ones. I, I can't bear to watch. Um, I think there's different sources for our appetite for them, but one is it might reflect what sometimes been called safe practice, where our minds are drawn to worst case scenarios as a way to practice encountering them. You know, an analogy I like is that is, is that of a flight simulator, which you got a flight simulator, you would often program it for difficult situations to get you practice into coping with them. You got them in real life. And sometimes I think our, our, our enjoyment of fiction and fantasy is sort of like we're running off a flight simulator. You've posed this question in your work as a hypothetical. Is consenting sex between adult siblings morally wrong? What's your view? Um, yes. I do Why? think it's morally wrong. Why? Because although as adults there, you know, there, there's a strong supposition to be that they're that they're free to do what they want. Um, I think that the problem is that when they're not adults, the fact that later on they could have sex and worse, say, between say a stepfather and a stepdaughter or some other or an, an, an uncle and a niece. Um, the idea that sex is a possibility in the future when they're adults corrodes the relationship early on. Does that make sense? This is my this is my utilitarian attempt to try to do a cost benefit analysis for what you were going to accuse me of being a of having a disgust reaction. I think you have a disgust reaction. That's fine. It sounds to me like an argument that it's imprudent, which can slide into morally wrong. But I still think there's something out of sync between the strength of our disgust reaction. And the degree of moral wrongness it has. I think I think that's right. I think that that if that was my argument, say, make it make it this ratchet it up a bit and make it a relationship between a father and an adult daughter. And I'd say brother sister. I could reword the question. Yeah. Adult sibling. I said siblings. So brother and sister or two sisters for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, that seems much less wrong than the stepfather and the daughter. It it does it does because in some way going back to my my point about about the it, as it brings us down to childhood, um, there's less of a power asymmetry. There's less of a case of an adult carefully grooming a child so that when she is of age, they could then have sex and it would be it would be okay. Um, I have a visceral response to it. I'll I'll give another argument, which is again trying not to be discussed space, which is that I think that there's a range of human relationships that are tremendously valuable. And sometimes they're better off without sex. I think it's I think um, you know, the relationship certain sex is great, connects to romance, connects to sort of a great degree of intimate relationships. But but some relationships are sex free like the relationship between most people and their, and their adult children. And that's, that's good. Now, as a CWT listener, might you be up for a round of overrated versus underrated? Yeah, I was hoping for this. Hit me. Okay, these are all easy. Jean Piaget, overrated or underrated? Underrated. He is, he is wrong in just about everything he said about kids. There's been studies finding that all, just about every claim he makes is 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 mistaken and overridden but he was a great scientist with with a great encompassing theory a lot of his theoretical foundations particularly the notion that children are like scientists exploring the world have stood the test of time also he was a sweet guy Un unlike freud he was you know he was biagi was a genuinely decent guy so i i i uh I, i'd say he's, he's underrated the notion of mirror neurons oh it shouldn't be rated at all. So horribly. it's just false, right? I'm not enough of a neuroscience to say it's entirely dead. Maybe, and people have talked about mirror neurons in, in primates being involved in, in, you know, in, in certain aspects of motor learning. And I'm not expert enough to say that that's all bogus, but was once hugely overrated in that this was the solution to everything. Explained autism, explained language learning, explained empathy, and the whole feel, I think, crash and if people and, and it's still overrated because some people don't know it crashed that was an easy one sociopaths overrated or underrated <laughs> you mean, that's harder you mean, right you mean the idea or the people no the actual ones they're very productive I, a lot of them right they are they are i think i think they're they're overrated i think that there's that 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 there's a sort of sexiness to this there was there was a, a woman who who was profiled in the new york times recently who described herself as a sociopath or or a psychopath that. and 
I don't know. I think there's there's a lot of allure to it and a lot of drama. A, many studies of psychopaths and sociopaths find that they're actually often below normal intelligence. They tend to be depressed. They're more likely to kill themselves. They kind of live lousy lives. They're not the sort of sexy, uh, conscience-free people we like to imagine. Suggesting that some degree that that we're that you and I, the non-sociopaths, are sensitive to this. And when we see a sociopath, we kind of run away. You're assuming I'm a non-sociopath, right? Oh, I know you well from the podcast. But it, a lot of people just think they're psychopaths, like they're all serial killers. And that's not true yeah. at all. No. So maybe they lack a moral sense, but if they can learn to behave according to incentives, maybe a lot just fit in. They learn how to flatter, say, because they're not held back by these other weird feelings that you shouldn't flatter your interviewer. You could get very far, but but the, the thing about the people we want to be around is we want them to be nice to us even when incentives aren't present. Carl Jung, overrated or underrated? Oh, yeah, hardly, hardly rated at all these days. Um, I think um, I think maybe just because of Jordan Peterson, who has been, been sort of promoting him, I often get people saying, why didn't you talk about Carl Jung in your book? Um, I would say... I'll, I'll say underrated in that what little I know about him seems quite interesting. And I think um, maybe he's been so eclipsed by Freud that nobody nobody gives his ideas any attention. Certainly ideas about – some of his ideas about the unconscious um, are worth study. So mildly underrated. Memory, Dreams, and Recollections is a great book, I think. And I believe with LLMs, Jung will make a comeback. In a sense, LLMs are tapping into a kind of Jungian subconscious – of all the data we've put out there. A sort of collective unconscious is now coming online. and But there's reinforcement learning applied to it, so it's also suppressed in a kind of Freudian way. So you get this weird mix of Jung and, Jung and Freud in contemporary well, LLMs. There's a book. There's a book there somewhere. Yeah. Asian tiger parenting, over or underrated? <laughs> um Amy Amy Chua, who who is a friend of mine, who brought the, the idea in her battle hymn of the tiger mother, um, I I I think underrated. I tend to be a rather I was I, I tend to be a rather permissive parent, but um, but the thing about it is a lot of these tiger parents end up with kids who are not merely successful, but happy and love their parents. So um, so it doesn't work for everybody. Either, either, not for every kid, nor for every parent. I, I, I could not fashion myself as a tiger dad. But, um, but I, I think we should take it more seriously. Do you need the whole community for it to work? Oh, yes. Yes. It's like, it's like everything else, you know, uh, cell phones, smartphones, and, and, and social media, and I don't know, sex, alcohol, where, where if you're one individual within a community doing it, it's extremely difficult. It's much easier to be any sort of parent if everybody else around you is the same sort of parent. Big five personality theory. Ah, uh, underrated. Stood, stood the test of time. And often when people complain about the replication crisis, they, they throw away all of psychology. And, but personality psychology has proven surprisingly robust. And I think there's a lot of sense and idea. I know you actually were somewhat critical of this in your book, Talents, the idea of the big five. But the idea that you could you could characterize somebody in terms of sort of five numbers, determining their openness and their conscientiousness and so on. What do, what do you think on that? I think it's overrated by people who use it in hiring, but I still think in general it's somewhat underrated. So we're maybe not far apart. Okay. People who don't know about the categories at all would do well to learn them. That's how well, I would put it. Yes, and you and and once you know about them, you should be flexible and 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 not take them too too seriously. What's a neglected classic in psychology that more people should read? Well, psychologists don't read. We we don't we don't read books. We don't read anything from um, from the past. So but you read. I I, uh, I I have gone through my my um, my adult life, my my whole life, without ever reading Principles of Psychology by William James. And then a couple of friends of mine invited me on their podcast to talk about his chapter on habit. And I read it and it blew me away. It's an incredible book. 
It's an incredible book. It is well written. It is sharp. He talks about instinct. He talks about nothing. It, it is, it is, it is a very contemporary voice. He's a lyrical, beautiful writer, and it's full of insights. And maybe it's an embarrassment to psychology that, you know, you could use it for an intro psych class and you would gain a lot. Why do religious people cry when their loved ones die? Assuming they believe in heaven, of course. Not all religions do. Yeah. Um, I think the answer is more... So, so some people say, and I have atheist friends, well, they're, they're hypocrites. They don't really believe in heaven. If they really believed in heaven, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't cry. They would rejoice. And the same thing when they're, with their own death. Um, I think there's belief and there's belief. I could have a very confident belief in heaven. Maybe I'm even 100% sure that I'll go to heaven when I die. But when faced with my own death, there are other systems that lead to tremendous fear. And when faced with the death of somebody I love, there are other systems in the head that could lead to terrible grief. So we're not unitary beings. It's possible for, upon learning my son has a terminal disease, for part of me to think, oh, well, he'll be reunited and he'll be in God and heaven be paradise and feel good about it and feel horrible grief. And yes, they can flick with one another, but that doesn't mean that doesn't this doesn't negate the existence of either one. What does the Hebrew Bible most get right and wrong about social psychology? So it uh, has mimetic desire, right? Peter Thiel will tell us that. I mean, how good is it as a kind of text in social psychology? Um I think it's a great text in social psychology and personality psychology and even a little bit of, of, of cognitive psychology. It, it captures in a very stark way the us-them uh, biases that are, that are present, um, that, that, that social psychology makes so much out of. It captures the idea of prejudice. It captures the idea of, of thinking about men and women, children and adults, uh, in-group, out-group, separately. I've been um I've been very interested. I've long been interested in the portrayal of God in in the Hebrew Bible, which is absolutely fascinating. Because people who haven't read it think, oh, you know, God all knowing, all loving, and everything. But in fact, he's this wonderful character. And this goes beyond social psychology, sort of talking about um about internal workings of the mind. I was I, I wrote in my Substack about the Passover story where, you know, he um he 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 sets the the plagues loose in the Pharaoh unless he lets the Jews go, and and Pharaoh says fine fine fine, and then the Pharaoh bends breaks and says fine you win, and then God fiddles with the Pharaoh's mind in this wonderful twist to say to make him uh, refuse, and and he says later I wanted to show off my powers we had gone this far, it's like I don't know it's the like invasion of Iraq or something it's it's, it's there are lovely stories there. I think it's brilliant on the mentality of whiners, like Book of Job, even Moses at times. You should write a book on social psychology in the Hebrew Bible. That's, a, that's an idea. Do you, you know what I like? God has so much patience for whiners in that, in that um, there's so many scenes where God destroys people who the slightest lack of faith with him. But, um, but, but when, when it comes to um, Moses pushing back, I don't want to do this, you know. Guys, okay, well, let's compromise. Or about the, he ends up negotiating over how many, when he destroys the world in the flood, over how many people to leave behind. If you whine to God, as Job did, sometimes he listens. What do you, Paul Bloom, maximize? Most recently, time with those I love. That's that's what I try. Um, also, time writing my tr time writing my Substack. So they're all the ones you love. They're all busy right now, and thus you're talking to me. <laughs> that's right. Well, you can. <laughs> they all turned you down, right? Well, you know, I, I, our, our relationship is just beginning. Who knows? You know, that's right. This is, this, um, but uh, but I, I I maximize different things than I did when I when I was younger. I I'm, I try to maximize money less. I still take money very seriously because, you know, we want to renovate our house, we want to travel and stuff like that. But but I, I've been very lucky to have deep connections with friends, my wife, with my children who are now adults. And 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 I sometimes have to remind myself, you end up getting you end up forgetting that these that this is what I ultimately wanna to, wanna to maximize. And what's your most unusual successful work habit? 
No, this is this is an easy one, as you as you may know. They're all easy in this in this episode. No, the one about lessons from social psychology <laughs> from the Hebrew Bible was not an easy one. Um, but uh, my most my my oddest work habit is that um, I I I work on not always but often in six minute bursts. So I I have a whiteboard right next to me, and uh, I'll work on a Substack for six minutes, then a reference letter for six minutes, then I'll rush and fold my laundry for six minutes, and then I'll answer email for six minutes, go on social media for six minutes, and then do this for ten more things, and go back to the Substack and repeat, and then three four hours will go by. And that's I don't recommend it for or you've set it like a timer, or is the the timing internal? Not an approximation. I have a timer. I try when my timer beeps. I could be mid word. I'll stop and go on to the next. And for me, A, I have very short, this keeps me from getting bored. And, and, and also by stopping mid word or stopping wherever I'm stopping, when I go back to it, the energy is still there to want to continue. I highly okay. recommend it to everybody. I've advocated a similar system that you should stop writing each day before you feel you're done. Yes, that's right. That's when right. you, when you don't want to stop, you're just about to write something really good. That's when shh, no more. Yes, and many people tomorrow. many people do the opposite. They have nice closure on this. They ended the paragraph, they ended the chapter, and then it's hard to start up next time. That's right. Yeah. That's excellent advice. And they're a little exhausted. Uh, very last question. What will you do next? I'm thinking I want to write a new book, but I'm not exactly sure of the topic. I've been playing around with different topics. I have something which, which I kind of like, but it's too early for me to, to talk about. But I really want to write a new book. And what's the algorithm you use to decide which th which topic it will be? Well, for this book, I, I I started to write a proposal on an idea, and I just couldn't make it interesting enough. It just it just so so because I I work by writing a proposal and sending it to my agent and so on. Often, if I could write a good proposal, then I know I have a good book. Not that the book's going to match the proposal in any interesting sense, but it means that 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 the material. That the material is there. Um, I, I, I guess another way of putting it is by the time I'm done with that, um, I know it'll be a good book or a good book for, for, for me if I couldn't live without writing it. If nobody wanted it, I'd write it anyway. Paul Bloom, thank you very much. And listeners, you can buy all of Paul, Paul's books. And again, his new substack is Small Potatoes. Just Google Paul Bloom, B-L-O-O-M, Small Potatoes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tyler. That was great.